Welcome everyone. My name is David Spadini and I'm a PhD student at Delft, University of Technology, and a researcher at SIG. Today I will present a paper called Investigating Severity Thresholds for Test Maps. As I just mentioned, I work at SIG and SIG is a consultancy company on code quality. We have many different tools to calculate code quality and report this feedback to the users, but recently we have launched an online assessment tool called Better Code App. Better Code App integrates with your GitHub account, and so you can log in through GitHub and you can analyze the code quality of your own report tools. Just to give you an example of what it looks like, this is the report uh, Better Code App produces, and Better Code App analyzes your GitHub repository following 10 guidelines, as you can see, such as, for example, the first one is write short units of code, that stands for line of lines of code of your methods, or simple units of code, that stands for complexity, duplication, coupling, etc. If you click on a failing guideline, it gives you detailed information on why it is failing, such as what are the problematic files or methods. Now, if we go back on the 10 guidelines, we can see that one of them is actually on test code quality. It's called automated tests, and currently, it measures assertion density and ratio between lines of code of test and production code. Now, the problem with how this metric is currently calculated is that it doesn't actually capture the quality of test code, but more how much test code there is. So, given our past research on test code quality and specifically on test mails, we thought, well, this is an amazing opportunity to change how this metric is calculated and actually measure test design issues such as test mails. By doing so, we can run a test mail study in an industry setting. Indeed, not only Better Code App is an industry tool, but it is also used by practitioners to calculate code quality metrics on closed source code. And secondly, we can measure test mail instances on participants' code. Indeed, previous studies on test mails were mainly run in a lab setting, meaning that test mails were measured on a manually created piece of code, and then participants were asked to find problems or give it a read. However, since Better Code App connects to your GitHub account, we can measure test mails directly on the participant code. So we did it. We selected a test mail detector, put it in Better Code App, and ran some pilots with developers within the company. And the results were horrible. <laughs> were really horrible. Developers did not like it at all. And mainly, this happened for two reasons. Reason number one, there were too many false positives. And if the tool outputs too many false positive, well, the developers start to not trust the metric, and maybe even when the tool is right and the instance is not a false positive, they still believe it's not right. So, for example, in the case of an eager test instance, the current detection rule is whether the number of production faults is higher than one. Well, that one is a little bit low according to them, and this is too sensitive, so it produces just too many false positives. The other reason is lack of prioritization. This means that, well, Again, in case of an eager test instance, while well, having two production calls is very different from having 10 production calls or 20 or 50. Hence, before going to production, we need to solve these two issues. Issue number one, we need to decrease the number of false positives reported by the detector, and we need to prioritize the most problematic test mass instances so that developers can focus on them first. To this aim, we designed a study that is structured into two research questions. First, we investigate how to give test mails a severity rating. Our aim here is to decrease the false positive and make the prioritization possible. And we, then, with this new threshold, we rerun the study using better code up, and we ask developers' opinion on test mails instances found in their own code. So for the first research question, to find new thresholds, we use the benchmark-based threshold derivation for each test mail. And for the second research question, we run a study using better code up and its users. So let's start with the first research question. As I previously mentioned, we use the benchmark-based threshold derivation to calculate new thresholds. And this is a methodology for deriving software metrics thresholds given a big corpus of projects. In our case, we used 1,500 open source projects downloaded from GitHub, including Eclipse and Apache projects. We chose this method because our metric do not follow a normal distribution. And this, this methodology allows us to wait for lines of code and furthermore, it gives us three different thresholds to identify medium, high, and very high risk categories. More details on this method can be found on our paper and the original one that proposes it. So just to give an example, to represent 90% of the overall code for the eager test metric, 
that the right threshold is 39. What does this mean with 39? Well, it means that 90% of the hundreds of thousands of test methods that we analyzed, weighted by lines of code and system size, have less than 39 production faults. In other words, if now we analyze a new test method that has more than 39 production calls, we can say that it belongs to the worst 10% methods that we ever analyzed. Okay, now let's have a look at the results. So these are the new thresholds. As you can see, we have medium high and very high risk categories. And the last column inside are the thresholds that were previously used. As you can see, they are almost all to zero. So even having one is, well, or is a red flag. And the only exception is eager test, for which the threshold is one. If we move to our threshold instead, we can see that they are substantially different for four test modes, the ones highlighted in green. For example, for eager test, we have that if a test method contains less than four production calls, we do not mark it as, as smelly. On the other hand, we can see that for the other test modes, the ones not highlighted in green, the thresholds are still set to zero. These are the rare smells, meaning that they happen so rarely in our corpus of projects that it's not possible to set thresholds different than zero. This is a limitation of the current approach, and in the discussion section of the paper, we propose alter alternative solutions. If we look at the smells for which we identify new thresholds, we now compare the proportion of the smells found using the new thresholds versus the old ones. Of course, since the new thresholds are stricter, we expect to have less instances, and this is the case. In average, our tool detects from 8% to 30% less test mail instances. However, with this change, we substantially decrease the number of what could be false positives. However, that these are false positives is just a hypothesis. We still do not know whether these thresholds are correct or not, and how developers perceive them. Hence, when we run the study in Vegacoda for RQ2, we actually inserted a question to validate our thresholds and ask developers to rate, according to them, the severity of the test mail instance. And this is the result. In the graphs, on the x-axis, we have the three thresholds, medium, high, and very high. And on the y-axis, we have the severity reported by the users as a Likert scale. And as you can see, especially for the conditional test logic and verbose test, there is a clear correlation between our thresholds and the user perceived severity. For the other two smells, the correlation is still present, but it is weaker. Hence, we can assert that our severity thresholds are aligned with developers' perception of severity. To sum up, for four test smells, we defined new and stricter thresholds that decrease the number of false positives detected by the tool. By using new thresholds, the test smells can now be prioritized, so developers can focus on the instances with higher impact first. Finally, developers' perceived impact aligns with our severity rating, demonstrating that thresholds correctly identify the worst cases. Once we define new thresholds, we move to our second research question, that is, how developers perceive test mails on their own code base. To this aim, we took the test mail detector with the new direct thresholds, inserting better code up, and we asked better code up users to participate in our study. 31 users did, rating around 300 test mails instances. This is an example of what it looked like. So on the left side, we have the name of the method, the color that identifies the severity of the smell, and on the right side, we had the type of smell. If the user clicked on an instance, we showed them an explanation of what the smell is, and then two mandatory questions. What is the impact of the smell on the maintainability of the code, and what action they are willing to take? In this case, we had three options, no fix, short-term refactoring, or long-term refactoring. And finally, we asked them how long it would take to fix the smell, and additional remarks. Finally, we showed them the actual code that was actually failing. Now we move to the results. In this table, we can see the maintainability impact of each smell rated by the developers. The ones with the highest impact are MPTest, so a test that does not contain code or assertions. This is because the test returns a green light, even though it doesn't actually test anything. Ignore test, so a test that uses the ignore annotation. And this is because if the annotation is not followed by a bug ID, it is hard to remember why the test was ignored in the first place. And conditional test logic, so tests with many branches, such as if else or while loops, and mainly because the test becomes hard to read and understand. On the other hand, the ones with the least impact on maintainability are assertion roulettes, so test that contains many assertions without message documentation, mystery guest, a test that uses an external file without checking whether it actually exists, and general fixture, so when fixture are not used in the tests. 
In this table, we can see for each smell whether the participants marked it as a short-term refactoring or long-term refactoring or no refactoring at all. So, as we can notice, the smells with the highest priorities in refactoring are empty test, sleepy test, a test with threat or sleep, and mystery guest. On the other hand, the ones with the least priority are eager test, so tests with too many production holes, ignore test, and general fixture. In the paper, for each smell, we analyze why the developers mark them in that way by looking at the additional remarks sections. But in this presentation, I do not have enough time to go through every smell, so in this case, I remind you to read the paper. However, I would like to discuss a bit the cases in which developers marked distances as one fix, as these are the areas in which we could potentially improve the detection. So in 38% of the cases, they dismiss them because hard to fix. In this case, developer either did not see the problem with the test or changing the test to remove the smell would require a significant amount of effort to fix. In 31% of the cases, they dismissed them even though it was an easy fix. In this case, developers either did not acknowledge them as a problem or are unwilling to refactor it to remove the test smell instance since the gain was perceived as marginal. 24% of the will not fix cases were marked as false positives. And this showed some limitations of our current tool, such as getters and setters counted for the eager test instances. And finally, 7% were marked as acknowledged, but I will not fix. And in this case, developers recognized the problem, but in the context of the test itself, it was an acceptable problem and they were not willing to refactor it. Finally, I would like to move to the discussion with some thoughts on how the entire study went. In the first research question, we define new severity thresholds to lower the amount of false positives we had, as well as give test smells instances priorities. Unfortunately, for five out of nine smells, we could not define thresholds different than zero. In this case, we need to define different ways to prioritize these instances. In many cases, unfortunately, the instances were marked as won't fix, mainly because these instances were only perceived to be marginal gains, and developers prefer to concentrate their efforts elsewhere. Finally, we have identified several limitations in how the test smells detector identifies test smells, and that the current definition of certain test smells does not match developers' perception or even common practices. This mismatch between developers' perception of what it is versus, versus is not a test smell cannot be fixed by setting thresholds alone. Further research needs to be carried on to identify new ways to detect test smells. And with this, I'd like to conclude. We wanted to study test smells in an industry setting, but we soon realized that the way test smells were calculated had some problems. So we designed a study to decrease the number of false positives in the detection of the smells and to allow developers to prioritize smell instances. Then, with a new severity threshold, we studied how developers perceive test smells in their own code base. Finally, we discussed some issues we faced when creating the severity thresholds and in the detection strategies. Thank you for watching.